this morning is discern and depart, discern and depart. And this is the, the third part, the third step, if you will, in this passage of scripture from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, where the Bible says, if anyone teaches otherwise, does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, and from such withdraw yourself. So in this beginning here, in this conclusion that Paul is setting up in this letter to Timothy, Paul is concerned once again with false teaching. And Paul is concerned that the Christians in Ephesus, through this teaching, through this instruction, would persevere to the end and be saved such that they would recognize and discern false teaching, false teachers, and the damning, destructive effects of that teaching in the life, and that they would discern that and depart from it, would have nothing to do with it. They would be warned, and then in that warning would protect themselves in the Word of God, uh, would cry out to God for help in that. For this reason, Paul warns Timothy and the church at Ephesus, and down through the ages, the church at large in our church today, warns us of the error of false teaching and instructs us to depart from it, discern and depart. Now, despite what many think today, this is the consistent teaching of the Bible. Throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, there is the ongoing bell that tolls. Discern false teaching and avoid it for the sake of your soul. Do not be deceived by the attacks of the enemy. Don't be deceived by false doctrine. Don't be led astray by false teachers. You will be led astray to your own destruction. Heed the warnings of Scripture to, for the benefit of your own soul. This is throughout the Bible. God hates. God hates. Most people aren't used to thinking about God hating anything. God hates false teaching. God hates false teachers. God hates error. This is because error, heresy in the church, false teaching leads to apostasy. People making shipwreck of their souls. It leads to ungodliness. It leads to false religion. It leads to false worship. And Lord created us, God created us to be worshipers of his. He's serious about his worship. Truth here is important. And we see in scripture some of the most, most scathing rebukes against false teaching uh, anywhere. And we see that from the pages of scripture. And consider for a moment the example of Jesus Christ himself in the New Testament. In the words of Jesus Christ, we see scathing rebukes, blistering rebukes against false teachers, against error, against heresy, against apostasy, against false religious leaders, against false worship. Think of one chapter alone in scripture, Matthew 23. Matthew 23, false teachers are called blind guides. They're called apostates. They're called vipers. They're called, this is, these are the words of Jesus Christ. They are serpents. They are snakes. They are hypocrites. They are sons of their father, the devil. They're sons of hell, Jesus says, and they travel around the world to make others twice as much sons of hell as they are. Um, they're not entering in, and they're blocking the door from others who want to enter in. He calls them blind guides, calls them fools, calls them filthy, whitewashed tombs, murderers, serpents, with the result from the words of Christ that these men are to be avoided. They're to be avoided because souls are at stake. This is not a this is not a game that we're entering into here. If you somehow view your Christian life as just a, a going through the motions, a, a week in and week out sort of a ritual that you participate in, you, listen, your soul is at stake and you're a fool to believe that. This is no game. There is a heaven and despite what a lot of her heretical teachers say, there is a hell and hell is real and there is a judgment awaiting. There's a judgment that hangs over the head of the lost. Uh, there is the real truth, not fiction, that people can be deceived. They can be deceived by their own wicked heart. They can certainly be, de be deceived by false teachers and error in the worldly philosophy that seeks to destroy people's souls. They can be deceived. So this is not a game. This is serious business. And these errors, these heresies are to be discerned and they're to be avoided. So imagine for a moment, if Christ said that in Matthew 23 in the New Testament, imagine for a moment how Jesus Christ might address a false teacher today. Would it be any different? No, wouldn't be any different at all. It's still the same war that we're fighting, right? 
still the same battle that we're fighting, many more heresies and errors today, many more false teachers today, and Jesus Christ, his words to them would be the same. There wouldn't be anything that would change about that. They produce sons of hell, and we must stand opposed to that. He wouldn't address them any differently. He uses these words because false teachers and false teaching needs to be categorically rejected, denounced, souls are at stake, and false teachers will lead many away to their eternal destruction. Many today in our politically correct society don't realize the havoc that is wrought by false teaching and error. How many people are swept away by false teaching and error? We're out witnessing on a regular basis. We see it, amen? One time after another, one person after another, one door after another, one conversation after another, those that are deceived by error, by heretics, by false teachers that, again, are leading people away to their own damnation. And we need to do the important work of warning them from the Bible. Christ warned them against false teachers. In the same, thing that we, same time that we preach the truth of God, we must also stand and preach against error that rises up against the knowledge of God. We have the responsibility to do both. That's all, not always politically correct, but it's biblically correct. We don't need to concern ourselves with being politically correct as much as we need to concern ourselves with being biblically correct. So in our text, we began in verse 3. First step that we went through was to discern the content of the false teacher's error. We looked at verse 3 at the content of their heresy, discerning the content of what they are teaching. Is it truth from the Bible or is it error? Is it biblical or is it unbiblical? And we examined there the first three tests from verse three that we could look at to determine that. First, the substance of what they're saying. Are, there, are they wholesome words? Are they words from the word of God? Are they wholesome? Second, we considered the source, the, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are they the words that God has revealed in scripture? And third, the standard, and the standard of the teaching is that this is the doctrine which accords with godliness. The doctrine that accords with ungodliness is the doctrine of a false teacher. Truth will produce holy living. Now, along those lines, we are commanded, compelled in Scripture, to live a godly life, to be holy living. And many would say, why? When the Lord saves you, listen, we're all saved by grace. And so why the, the concern? Why all the effort? Why all the striving and the toiling to live a godly life, a holy life? We just need to do the best we can. You know, and besides, listen, if we're going to live more holy and going to overcome sin, it's going to be God that does it in us anyway. So why all the effort? Brian Chappell, Chappell answers this question this way. Why be concerned about godliness since we are saved by grace? Because, say the scriptures, when the filth of my sin was sweeping me in my helplessness to eternal death, God came calling. He covered himself in the muck of this world to rescue me embraced me despite my filth, and now he wants me out of the mud. God saved us out of the mud. How can we, who are saved by Christ, live any other way? How can we continue to live in it? It's a question of Paul in Romans. He goes on to say, such grace should make us so in love with God that we cannot stand in our lives what resoils us and offends him. He says, ours is an intolerant grace. Listen, your love for Christ, your gratefulness to Christ for dragging you out of the muck of your own sin, dragging you out of the, the filth of your own life and saving your wretched soul, the glory of that, the blessing of that, the reality of that should compel you with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength to live for him who saved you, who cleansed you, who pardoned you. You rightly deserve to pay for your sin in hell for all eternity, and God spared you that by giving his own son who died on Calvary's cross, shed his blood for you, a wretched sinner. Well, that should compel us, should it not? Think about just in, in, basic, in basic terms, in an il illustration of that. Someone gave his life, let's say you were walking in traffic, and someone came and pushed you out of the way and was run over by the truck and saved your life. Are you going to be grateful for that? Or immediately, are you just going to go back to, eh, thanks a lot, you know, in honor with your regular life? That's going to have an impact on you, isn't it? What if the mother of that guy who saved you, what if the mother came and said, listen, just if you would, as a, as a, as a, out of thankfulness to my son, he gave his life, that was my son, and he died. Would you just remember him on his birthday each year? When his birthday rolled around, are you just going to be I've got so much to do today. Look, I'm just not going to be able to make it. 
No, he saved you. You'd remember, think about it just logically. We should give our lives because our love and our thankfulness to God in Christ compels us. But it's not just our love for him. The love of God in Christ toward us should compel us to live wholeheartedly for him, right? The fact that God gave everything, including his own son, to save sinners like you and I. That, that love should compel us to serve him, to love him, to, to wretch sin out of our lives and to live more wholeheartedly for him. But that's not all. The grace of God in Christ Jesus our Lord is not simply an intolerant grace. It is an efficacious grace. It's a working grace. It's a grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness and to live righteously in this present age. It is a working grace. As we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, it's the grace of God at work in us to do and to will according to his good pleasure. It's his grace at work to separate us from sin, to sanctify us, to purify us, to help us to live the Christian life. A primary concern and desire on the part of the Christian should be to adorn the doctrine of our God with godliness, with a holy life. We should adorn the gospel with credibility, with evidence of the power of God in the gospel to transform a life. Again, this is, not, this is not a matter of semantics. This is not a matter of opinion. This is not a matter of uh, just sort of going through the motions here. There is miraculous power in the gospel that will transform a hard-hearted sinner stuck in his own ways, can't do anything but sin, rejoices in his sin, revels in his sin, makes provision for his sin, will change the desires of that wretched sinner into a God-exalting, Christ-honoring trophy of grace. And we must give evidence, demonstration of that power in the gospel. That you are saved to live your life before a lost and dying world to give testimony of that power. This is not mere semantics here. This is not just a, an empty tale, a fiction that we participate in each week. There is power to change a life. And we're to be testimonies of that power. We're to give evidence of that power. When your life, listen, when your life demonstrates no freedom from sin, when your life demonstrates no fervency for God, when your life gives no evidence of your slavery to righteousness, when your life gives no evidence of a new creation, your life gives no evidence of having been transformed, then you say by your life that the gospel makes no difference. You say by your life that the gospel has no power. By your life, you deny the word of God. By your life, you make God a liar. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. To be ungodly is to deny the word of God. It is to reject the gospel. Uh, it is to reject the power of God unto salvation. Our zeal, our fervor for godliness, uh, our obedience to Christ, your fervency in the Christian life demonstrates that you're a new creation. It demonstrates that you have a desire for his name, your devotion to him, your love for him, your devotion to his cause, your devotion to the kingdom. And that's why the Bible can say that salvation is not by works, but at the same time, the Bible can say that he who obeys me, it's he who loves me right? Our love for him compels us, and it's also his love for us that should compel us. So it is the doctrine. It is the doctrine which accords with godliness, and we're to live a godly life for those reasons. Now, once we've discerned the content, according to those three categories, the substance, the source, and the standard, once we've discerned the content of false teaching, our text here in verse 4 moves on then to discerning the character of the false teacher. We're, we're given knowledge here of the character of the false teacher, We've discerned the content, now we're discerning the character of the false teacher. Verse four, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Now, I wanna point out here first from verse four that this is, verse four, in keeping with what Paul just taught in verse three. In verse three, teaching in the positive, the doctrine of God, it's the wholesome words that lead to godliness, that lead to godly life, healthy living, vital, vibrant Christian life, okay? But here in verse four, described in the negative, it is the false teaching, the error, the heresy here that leads to the opposite, 
It accords itself with ungodliness, with a wicked character. Uh, these false teachers have abandoned the truth, and so they've abandoned holy living. They've abandoned godliness. False teaching has its fruit, and you'll know them by their fruits, as the Bible says. And so here in verse 4, we're going to see that that fruit, the fruit of false teaching, we're going to see that fruit in the character of the false teacher. Now, Paul says, if a man doesn't teach this doctrine, the doctrine which accords with godliness, that first he is proud. Interesting here in verse 4, the prevailing character trait of the false teacher is that he's proud. Pride, the prevailing character trait of the false character trait of the false teacher. It's from a Greek word that means puffed up with smoke. They're full of hot air, all right? One way to think about it. They're full of hot air, puffed up with smoke. It's a an empty, vaporous pride. It's just puffed up for no good reason, but they're puffed up. They have an inflated sense of their own self-importance, an inflated sense of their own understanding, their own doctrine, their own thinking, their own desires, their own will. And imagine that for a moment, this pride. A false teacher has to, by default, put their words, their understanding, their belief, their doctrine, they have to put that above the Bible, above God's, now that is the, the height of ignorance, the height of pride, the height of arrogance. It is foolish pride. Put your own words, your own understanding over the Bible. Now you may say to yourself, well, I've talked to some people before. It seems like a really, really nice guy. He's just teaching error. Really nice guy, but just teaching error. Listen, the Lord has given us his word. Today, with all the resources that we have, you can get to the word of God within a matter of seconds on your computer. People have multiple copies in their home. If I don't avail myself to understand the truth of God's word, no matter how nice I am or no matter well intended I am, if I haven't taken the time to learn this such that then I place my own opinions, my own belief, my own understanding above this, that is the height of pride the height of arrogance, and it is stupid. <laughs> These are the words of God. It's the word of God. And so you, that's why I let not many of you become teachers, because you'll face a stricter judgment. Um, this is the word of God. It's often, it may not be the words, their understanding that they place over the Bible. They might do that with their lives. They might do that in the way that they live. There are many, many examples of this. Let me give you an example. False teacher says to himself, a, a, a very common characteristic of false teachers in the Bible is that they're given to covetousness. Jeremiah says, from the least of them to the greatest of them, they are all given to covetousness, right? So they want, they're covetous, right? False teachers covetous. So they say to themselves, uh, I want to be rich off this deal. You know, I want to be rich. I want to have my own private plane. You know, I want to have a mansion in LA. Uh, I want the, the fancy car. I, I'm going to get rich off this deal. So they, they may say that subconsciously, right? Whatever the case may be, they're going to be rich. So what they do then is they then twist scripture in order to justify their desire to be rich. Justify their desire to hang the million dollar chandelier in the lobby of the church. You know, justify, have all the trappings, all the, you know, rich, they just want wealth and it's in their pride that they do it, but they twist the scripture to justify themselves and their desire to be rich. It's a twisting of the Bible to justify their sin. And it happens all the time, doesn't it? All of a sudden, the Bible now becomes a springboard for explaining their false doctrine, their heresy. I've often wondered, and how do you preach that knowing that there are those in the slums in India, the slums in Brazil? If you've seen some of the, the poverty around the world, how do you preach health, wealth, prosperity? How do you preach that getting rich doctrine to those who are in utter almost unimaginable poverty. It is a doctrine of demons and it will lead people to their destruction. They invent a theology that God wants them rich and they justify themselves with a twisting of their theology. Uh, often evangelized to false teachers. I know many of you have as well. Uh, they have no problem adding, changing, turning around, deleting things from the Bible in order to uh, justify their twisted theology. Uh, their twisted approach to the Word of God. I've often asked them before, why don't you just use His words? Listen, if you're going to preach the Bible, why don't you use His words instead of making up these things on your own? Um, it is great, great pride. Peter calls them, in 2 Peter, calls their words great swelling words of emptiness. 
Paul calls them vainly puffed up by their fleshly mind. Now, to a lesser degree, so that we understand this, to a lesser degree, Christians can be caught up in this same error, very same error. Uh, think of the many that change their theology of tithing because it gives them opportunity not to tithe, not to give. They adjust their theology because they want to be justified in disobedience. Think about the many that change their theology of divorce to give them an open door out of a bad marriage, to give them an opportunity to sidestep the clear commands of Scripture. I remember once um, getting a call. I've gotten actually few times had calls like this. Got a call from a lady in a bad marriage. She's having trouble in her marriage and wanted to get out, wanted to divorce. And basically within a, a you know, short time of talking to her, I realized that she was shopping counsel. She was going to call pastor after pastor after pastor until she found that pastor that would justify her in her decision to divorce him. It wasn't asking, honest to ask for requests for counsel. Uh, and she eventually found somebody who did just that, and she divorced her husband. Unbiblically, I might add, in sin. So uh, twisting theology to try to justify sin, twisting theology to try to, all in pride, all in pride. Just not submitting yourself to simply what the Word of God says. There's great blessing, great blessing in that. If you will just have the idea, the, the thought that, listen, if, God words, if God's Word says it, that settles it. I'm just going to obey it. And you live for the Lord, there's great blessing in that. Just obey the Lord. Oftentimes, because of this pride, something that should be very clear becomes contorted. Because of this pride, something that should be very simple becomes something that is disputed. And we see this frequently. Uh, this error, doing this, is representative of those, for example, who don't evangelize. And so they take something that's very simple, very clear in Scripture, Share the gospel with every creature. You can't get more clear than that. It's a command to every Christian. And yet they take that doctrine from Scripture, twist it and contort it and dispute it into something that is no longer clear and simple in order to justify themselves and their lack of evangelism. They'll say, listen, not everybody's gifted. Uh, not everybody has that gift. Not everybody is comfortable talking to people. Uh, not everybody has that. You know, there's a difference between the word evangelist and witness in Scripture. And so... Right? It's just, it's take something that's very simple, and now it's a dispute over words. Take something that's very simple. Listen, if you're standing next to a lost person, what's the godly thing to do? Give them the gospel. They need, they need the Lord. Right? That's a godly thing. It's a doctrine that accords with godliness. Just give them the gospel. It's just um, very simple, and yet twisted and contorted. They make it into something that is not so simple. Meanwhile, in all of this, Scripture is very clear. Very clear. All right? They start off proud. He is proud, next, knowing nothing. It is amazing to me, but true, that pride and ignorance always go together. Pride and ignorance. Proud, knowing nothing. In 1 Timothy 1, uh, Paul says of them, they desire to be teachers, and yet they don't understand what they're teaching. Don't understand what they affirm. They know nothing. Pride and ignorance. Professing to become wise, the Bible says, they become what? Fools. They become fools. For all of their blustering, all of their supposed scholarship, for some of them, all of their degrees through years and years of seminary, one PhD after another, they are fools. And knowing nothing, just proud knowing nothing. That's why, and we've experienced this, we've seen this, right? That's why a brand new baby Christian, fresh out of the oven, <laughs> with just some Bible, being in a good healthy church for a few months, can be more able to harmonize and relate the word of God to the Christian life than some seminary trained PhDs can. They just see it. They have the spirit of God in them. They've been in a good church. They have more understanding of it than the heretic who's been to seminary and has a PhD. They know nothing. That pride and that ignorance go together. If you, in your pride, take a step outside of the truth of God's word, you're now in ignorant land. <laughs> Uh, the truth of God's word. There is wisdom in God's word. There is foolishness in everything else. Uh, as soon as you depart the word of God, you're into knowing nothing. Uh, that goes with anything. You need to be in the word of God, know the word of God. There's wisdom in the word of God. This pride uh, that lends itself now to ignorance then demonstrates itself in being obsessed. Verse four, he is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. Not the word of God, mind you. But he's obsessed with uh, his own self-interests, 
his own controversies, his own arguments over words. Now, they may be words from the Bible, but he's pulling them out of Scripture to dispute them, to cause controversy, to cause arguments and disputes. The word obsessed there is very interesting. That word means to be sick. Very interesting here. And I want you to see this uh, comparison contrast from verse 3. In verse 3, we have the wholesome words, and we talked about that, the being healthy words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then here in verse 4, you have sick, the being sick words, being obsessed, being sick with error. False teaching, heresy, error, is like a spreading cancer. It's a leaven within you. Listen, it's a leaven within you. It's also a leaven within the church. And that's why it has to be cut out. That heresy, that error becomes a sickly influence. Just in the same way that if you invest yourself in the being healthy, wholesome words of God, you're going to be spiritually healthy. You're going to be nourished. The Lord is going to sanctify you and grow you and mature you and build your faith. It's just being healthy, right? But as soon as you abandon that, you're left with now being sick and error and heresy and worldly reasoning and philosophy and psychology and all that kind of nonsense is going to lead to just spiritual sickness, spiritual disease, a spreading cancer. He here that has forsaken the word of God has become sick. And he's become sick with two things. The first is disputes. The second is arguments over words. Disputes means debates, controversy, argument. He poses controversial questions and positions over useless things with the intent of getting someone embroiled over this nonsense, embroiled over garbage, majoring in the minors, right? I think Adam had a belly button. No, Adam didn't have a belly button. I think he did have a belly button. I mean, come on. It, it's, it majoring in the minors, disputes over things that don't mean anything, just embroiled. And this is, he's got, this, he's sick with those kinds of debates and controversies and arguments. Um, the next is arguments over words. These are in the TDNT, it's word battles, just gets into word battles. Um, is evangelist different than witness? Okay, they're different of the same. Listen, get out and witness, get out and evangelize. Uh, same intent there from scripture. He's arguing over minor issues. Uh, what they are not obsessed over is studying, knowing, and then applying and obeying God's word. Uh, you can get so embroiled in majoring on the minors, the rest of your Christian life is falling apart if you're a Christian at all, right? It's just falling apart around you, but you're getting to every fine point that you can get to. Is it good to study theology? Amen it is. But you can take something that God means for good and you can corrupt it. And that's what's going on here. Now put these three things together. In his pride... The false teacher is self-willed, thinks he knows best, right? So in his pride, and now because he has forsaken God's truth in accord with his own desires, his own idea of truth, he is really, he's ignorant. He knows nothing. In his prideful ignorance now, he gets embroiled in a sick preoccupation with disputes, with controversy, with arguments over words. And we've known guys like this, right? Right? you've ever talked to like this, it is an exercise in futility, an exercise in frustration to talk to some of these guys. Proud, knowing nothing, just simply interested in disputes and arguments over words. Not grounded in the word of God, it just leads to meaningless preoccupations. Now, there's a point of application here for us. And again, uh, if you'll permit me to make an argument from the greater to the lesser here, it doesn't have to rise to this level to be a problem. There is a level here at which the Christian can sink to, or the Christian can find himself in hot water over. In other words, you become so consumed with a particular point of doctrine that it begins to impact your Christian life. And rather than cause good for you, it begins to become harmful. Take, for example, the brand new, fresh out of the oven Calvinist, right? And maybe a Calvinist in the Arminian church that he's been going to for years, you can become so preoccupied with that one doctrine, the rest of your spiritual life is going down the tubes, and yet you know every fine point of Calvinism, and you're arguing with every single person you can come across to argue with to find people to argue with over that doctrine. Is that healthy for you? No. Is it good to study Calvinism? Amen. Is it good to spot heresy and battle against heresy? Amen. But don't get yourself so consumed that it becomes harmful to you. Uh, think of the person that comes across um, 
a new theology, like a system of theology. You got guys that are studying dispensational theology or covenant theology. You can become so connected, so consumed by that point of theology that your marriage is falling apart. You're not witnessing. You're no longer loving your brother at group. You're just consumed with arguing about covenant theology or dispensational theology. And that consumes your Christian life. Is that healthy? No. No. Is it good to study theology? Amen. It's good to study theology. Is it good to understand some of those things? Are those blessings to understand things from the Word of God? Yes, they are. But you know what else can happen? You can think to yourself, you know, you come across this new nugget of theology and you think to yourself, wow, the Holy Spirit revealed that to me and didn't reveal it to any of you guys, right? And so I'm going to go around preaching, espousing, and, and propagating that because I am so smart, so prideful. And you can become embroiled in ignorance knowing nothing because now as a result of your pride, as a result of uh, your con being consumed with this, that you end up calling, causing strife and divisions and reviling and right bad fruit. So you've got to be careful. The Christian can sink into this kind of thing. They can become, they can take that which is good and corrupt it. That's what we in our flesh do. Take something that's given by God as a great blessing, uh, a great gift to his people, and we can corrupt it and make it something that is harmful. So an example is you study and you stop thinking about your marriage. You study and you neglect your kids. You study and you stop evangelizing. You study, you get knowledge. And what does knowledge do in scripture? Knowledge puffs up. You get proud, you get divisive. And you, all these things, this is easy to do. You can do this in your evangelism, can't you? With, with lost people who need the Lord. You can approach a person with a haughty attitude, beating them over the head and shoulders with all that you know when they need the Lord, they need to be saved. They need to have the word of God pierce their heart, become convicted over sin such that they can see Christ and they can see the glories of the gospel and the Lord can save them and you're too busy espousing your theological knowledge. You know, the old axiom, there's an old axiom and it's axiomatic because it's true that they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's axiomatic because it's true. Um, you can do that in your evangelism. You get too big for your britches. <laughs> it's pride. It is pride. Pride, pride, pride. Pour contempt on your pride. Humble yourself. Humble yourself and make sure that you're in the Word of God, doing what the Word of God would have you do. Um, by the way, this points to, and I want to make this point just as a result of this, um, this points to another reason. This issue of pride, and boasting, points to another reason why the Arminian idea of salvation is erroneous, is false, is unbiblical. Salvation is of the Lord, entirely of the Lord. It's not by your work, not by your decision, not by your knowledge, not by your good works, not by anything that you do that saves you. And so the Arminian would say, you've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice to ask Jesus into your heart. You've got to make a choice to receive Christ. Well, let me ask you, you make that choice. You decide to pray to receive Christ, to ask him to be your personal Lord and Savior. You decide to walk that aisle, ask Jesus into your heart and be saved. You decide. Well, why didn't so-and-so decide? They didn't decide. So does that make you smarter than them? And, you know, Christian instantly knows that's, that's not right. No, it didn't make me smart. Does it make you more righteous than they are? And a person says, oh, no, it doesn't make me more righteous, more holy than they are. Why doesn't it? Why doesn't it make you smarter? Why doesn't it make you more righteous? You've decided they didn't. You made the smart choice. They made the dumb choice. You did the righteous thing. They've obviously done the unrighteous thing. So it makes you smarter, makes you more righteous. It gives you something about which you can boast, right? That is a prideful, it's a prideful theology. It's a man-centered theology. It's not the gospel of the Bible. God saves, salvation is entirely of him. And that truth should humble the Christian. My salvation is entirely of God because God in his grace and in his mercy intervened in my love of sin and saved my wretched soul. God saves, right? Doesn't give any reason for us anywhere in scripture about which anything that we can boast about. We have nothing that we can boast about. No room whatsoever in us for pride. If you're trusting in some decision you made, if you're trusting in some choice Trusting in something you did, you need to turn to Christ and be saved. Don't put your trust there. Your trust belongs in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. 
right? But now further describing their character. We're looking at discerning the character of the false teacher. Back in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5 now, further describing their character, the Bible goes on to say that they are men of corrupt minds. Men of corrupt minds in verse 5. This is just another way of saying totally depraved. Their mind, their thinking is depraved. They are lost. They don't understand the things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he. It's not that nor won't he. It could be nor won't he, but nor can he. He's unable. He cannot get it because, the Bible says, they are spiritually discerned. The natural man there is a lost person, totally depraved, sinner, dead in their sins and trespasses. Listen to this description of the corrupt mind from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. There Paul says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind. Their minds are just futile. Their thoughts are futile. Their intentions are just, everything is just an exercise in futility. That you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. It's interesting there how this ignorance of the word of God leads to sin. You don't know the word of God, it leads to ungodliness. You know the word of God, you have the spirit of God in you through the word of God, it leads to godliness. Here, this, not, this ignorance, their understanding is darkened, leads to lewdness, uncleanness, greediness, right? So they're men of corrupt minds. Goes on to say in verse five that they are destitute of the truth, destitute. Now we think of destitute as just being totally absent of. It's a state or a condition that we're in, we have no truth. Destitute of the truth means no truth. But it's interesting, this word in the Greek actually means an ongoing, it's a verb here, it means to rob or to steal. Uh, there's something that is being stolen away, drifting away, being pulled away from them. And what is that here? It's the truth. It's passive here, which means that there's this progressive or gradual taking away of the truth from them. They're not doing it themselves, it's being done to them. Now think about that for a moment. If it's being done to them, who's that being done by? Lord of God, the Word of God is being pulled away from them. Uh, the Lord is not giving them any longer to revelation, God's truth, wholesome words are gonna lead to godliness. He is turning them over to a debased mind and they are becoming gradually over time more and more destitute of the truth. They have less and less revelation. Listen, it gets to a point, this leads to apostasy. It leads to apostasy. We said last week, we made the comment that Oftentimes, this drift toward hell doesn't happen in a one argument or one conversation. It happens by small degrees over time. This is saying basically the same thing, that you abandon God's truth, you reject it, you don't consent with wholesome words, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, you start becoming destitute. You, you start losing your grasp on the truth slowly and slowly and slowly over time until the point you reach a point of no return, until you've had the most revelation that God is going to give you, and then and you've rejected that, and now you're lost eternally with no hope. The, the Lord says that my spirit will not always strive with man. If you come week after week after week, you're gonna hold that sin, hold that sin, hold that sin, hold that sin, and not repent of it, there'll come a point where God will say, have at it, and he will turn you over to it. It's the, the judgment, if you will, of abandonment. He's gonna say, have at it. My spirit will not always strive with man. There'll come a point you reject God's word, reject God's word, reject his offer of grace in Christ and you reject and you reject and reject and then it'll come a point where God's gonna say, that's it. You're gonna get the maximum amount of revelation that the Lord intends for you to have and at that point you are done. Here, they reject the truth, reject the truth, reject the truth and they reach a point where they are irretrievable. And I wanted to give you an example of that. Go to Hebrews chapter six. Hebrews chapter six. The state at which they arrive is irreversible. You cannot come back from it. Now, it happens often by small degrees over time, but you eventually find yourself in a position where you are lost forever with no hope. Your opportunity to have turned at God's reproof and embraced Christ by faith will have passed. His spirit will not always strive with man. In Hebrews chapter six, listen to what it says here, beginning in verse four. This is frightening. 
frightening. If you find yourself slipping away from Christ, slipping away from God, does it mean you're losing your salvation? No. It means you're never saved to begin with. This is a very real, this is not fictitious in the book of Hebrews. This is not theoretical. It's not just something that it was laid there simply only to, you know, cause you to, there's a reality here. There's reality. This is warning for Christians. These were written to people who profess Christ. Hebrews chapter six, verse four. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Impossible. You reach a point of no return. Now listen, someone might listen to that and say, well, he's talking about Christians there. And we know from the Bible that you can't lose your salvation. These are those that profess the name of Christ. They think of themselves as Christians. They've heard the word of God and then they depart. They prove themselves never to have been Christians at all. James says they went out from us because they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But because they went out, they made manifest they were never of us. That's John. Impossible for those who were once enlightened. Enlightened there is given the truth of God given the truth of the word of God. They've had their minds enlightened to the truth of the gospel, the truth of what the Bible says. They've heard that. They have opportunity to, to understand it in the way that they can understand it. And it says, and have tasted the heavenly gift. They come to a church like this and they see the fellowship, the love of the brother. They get invited to fellowship. They get brothers and sisters talking to them about their soul, caring for them. Maybe they meet a need or two. They're loving on them, right? They're tasting of this heavenly gift. They are in our love feast, so to speak, reaping the benefits of that love feast that we have together. They get a plate of food that comes across their, their, their table, right? Uh, they're in our love feast. They're getting some of those benefits. They have tasted of the heavenly gift. They have par partakers, become partakers of the Holy Spirit in the sense that come into a biblical church where the Holy Spirit is at work and they see the effects of the Holy Spirit. They see people radically transformed. At this point in time, they were a wicked, godless sinner, mean-spirited guy you wouldn't want to spend two minutes with, and now they are loving trophies of God's grace that you can't wait to get over for fellowship. You know, they, they see the work of the Holy Spirit. Lives transformed, people loving one another. They see a, a taste of glory, you know, and they, in that sense, and even coming into the church, they are protected, if you will, being within the body of Christ with some overspill of God's grace to genuine Christians. They've become partakers in a sense of what the Holy Spirit is doing. And then it says, if they fall away then. And what that's talking about there is, you know, you say, I understand what's going on here. I understand what the word of God says. I've heard the gospel. I believe Jesus Christ. I know what God intends. I know what they're saying. I know this is true. I see the work of the Spirit. You know what? I just, I want my life. I want my sin. I want to do things my way got my own agenda. Listen, this passage would apply to you. And we've known, if you've been around this church for any length of time, we've known those that have made just that decision. And at that point, what the scripture says is that that state is irreversible. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they crucified for themselves again the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Your opportunity, if you're not careful, your opportunity will pass and it will forever pass, and you'll find yourself one day in hell, just destitute of the truth, just gradual. You know, in Amos, uh, God speaks of a famine in, among his people, of his word. Not a famine of food, of bread, but a famine of God's word. If you reject and dishonor his word with your life or with your rejection, with your rebellion, with your sin, if you continue to do that, Eventually, God will give you over to a famine of his word and you'll be without it. It will be taken away from you and you'll become destitute of the truth. But this goes on to say here, the men of corrupt minds are destitute of the truth, but that they're covetousness. It says in verse five, they suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Here, the word godliness is almost sarcastic. It's a twisting. It's the godliness that they perceive in their own minds, right? They've sort of twisted it twisted understanding of it. It's like Simon Magus in Acts 8. Simon at Magus saw the work of the Holy Spirit and he saw it as a power that he wanted. And it's a power that he wanted because he could get rich off of it. You know? So he wanted to buy that power from them. So he 
perceived a godliness, twisted understanding of godliness, and he wanted to buy that. He saw that as a means of great gain. And Jeremiah says again, from the least of them to the greatest of them, they're all given over to covetousness. And we see that routinely in many ways. Certainly, right, that includes wealth. You've got those guys that will do this because they see it as a way to get rich. But there's also covetousness in many other ways. You see covetousness for numbers. Uh, a church that I went to, false teacher, false gospel, false church. And he would stand up there and say, you know, I've been called of God to lead a large church. So everything that they were about was about getting numbers because he wanted to lead a large church. It's covetousness. That is covetousness, pride in numbers, in results, covetousness. All of that could be, that issue with covetousness could be summed up by its motive. There are motives uh, and they are greedy to satisfy their own motive for what they're doing. Maybe a motive for wealth, maybe a motive for numbers, uh, maybe a motive for dishonest gain in some way, maybe a motive for fame, you know, maybe a motive for you know, getting on LA preachers next, ep- next you know, series, uh, whatever, it's gonna be the motive, but it's the motive that displays or that exposes their covetousness. Uh, Here you get a glimpse of their character. Now, this influence, the influence of this kind of character must be cut off from among God's people. This is 11. It spreads like gangrene and it can be devastating to the church. So they must be put out. They must be avoided. And that's where we get the end of uh, verse five. Third point in your note, we've discerned the content. We've discerned their character. Now let's discern the consequences. Uh, Quickly in verse four and in verse five, we see these consequences of their false teaching. We see that false teaching produces fruit. We'll know them by their fruits. So what does false teaching produce? First, it produces envy. Envy. It's in verse four, he's proud knowing nothing. He's obsessed with disputes. You see his character there, arguments over words, from which, from that character, or out of that character, which arise envy, revilings, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men, these consequences. Envy is a jealousy despising the, the, the success of others, uh, despising the contentment of others, uh, hating that, that envy leads to strife. James says, what, are the, what is the source of the quarrels and conflicts among you? It's because you want envy and you don't have. So it creates strife. Um, you want, you cannot obtain, and so you fight and quarrel. That strife leads to reviling. Reviling here is abusive language. This is the word in Greek that we derive our word blasphemy from. So in a sense, you know, using that word, you're sort of blaspheming another person. You're reviling them. Um, It carries the sense also of slander. Uh, Four, evil suspicions. This word carries the sense of something arising in your understanding and working itself into your mind. It's, it comes from a preposition, a word that's sort of rising words coming up from under. It's to perceive something behind plain sight that is characterized here as evil or bad. So someone walks through the front door of the church and says, hey, good morning, brother. So good to see you. You think to yourself, what did he mean by that? <laughs> All right? That's evil suspicion. Now, you meant something bad by that. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to get to the bottom of that. Evil suspicion. It's, deri- it's described as evil poor, wicked, bad, vicious, degenerate, evil conjectures, figments of your depraved imagination. But lastly, in verse five, useless wranglings of men. All this leads to just constant friction, constant irritation, just useless wranglings. All of these, envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings associated with and used in the Bible to describe unregenerate man, lost person describes a lost person. And all of this, if it, if it is allowed to continue in the church, will undermine, subvert our peace, our unity. It will destroy the church. And we've seen that. We see that in other churches too, don't we? You know, you look at the fruit of teaching. What does that fruit produce? I, you know, I love, I love this church. And I, we've had many visitors that have come. They, wow, you know, how loving the people are, uh, how biblically astute the people are. How, you know, they just want to be faithful. They love preaching. Um, you know, we had conferences and somebody like a, uh, our brother, Mike Avendroth, we love very much, would come and he was blessed, you know, by being here. Like we are, we're blessed by being here. And I often say, I often say, listen, that doesn't happen by accident. It's the grace of God in the people of God that gives them a love for the word of God. And it's out of the word of God being wholesome words that godliness comes, that love comes, that faithfulness of the Lord comes. It doesn't happen by accident. It is by 
God's grace through his word, that all that, all glory to God, that that takes place. But I know I have been a part of churches, so-called, and I know you, many of you have too, where you see the fruit of their, that teaching, and it's not love. It is strife and envy and reviling and evil suspicion. These things don't happen by accident. They happen, and we see the means of God at work here through the word of God to produce a church that we love and we feel very blessed to have, amen? And we've got a long way to go. I don't want to puff you up. <laughs> we have a lot we need to work on, a lot we need to obey the Lord, and we need to, you know, fervently live for him. We've got a lot to learn, a lot of maturing to do, but we're blessed by what God has done here. So that all, listen, it's got to be cut out. If it's evil, it's going to lead to more evil. If it's bad doctrine, it's going to lead to bad living. It's got to be cut out. And so last point on your notes is point four, discern then and depart. Discern the content, discern the character of these false teachers, discern the consequences of that teaching, and then depart, separate from it. Now, in some of your translations, your ESV or your NASB, doesn't have that last phrase in there, from such withdraw yourself. The New King James uses a different set of manuscripts for the translation, so it was in there. Let me tell you, though, that that from, your, from, from them, withdraw yourself, is that a biblical teaching? Yes. There's nothing here unbiblical. It doesn't affect meaning at all. Um, this is the biblical doctrine of separation. And if this happens, you're to separate from them. Ernest Pickering said this, few are anxious to plunge themselves into the teeth of a howling storm, right? And yet to lift the banner of God's truth is to bring down upon one's head all the raging storms of hell. And all God's people who are faithful say, amen. amen. For this reason, those who would hold strongly and uncompromisingly to the whole revealed truth of God have ever found themselves a despised company and a pilgrim people. God has continually exhorted his people to walk in purity and holy separation and to keep themselves unspotted from the world. And we generally look at scripture with respect to separation along three different lines. You have separation from the world. We've heard speak often of separation of church and state but there's also separation of false teaching, separation from apostasy or error. God hates false teaching, which is false religion, leads to idolatry, leads to false worship. So God hates it, we're to separate from it. Now, quickly, we see that example throughout scripture. In Exodus, with the people of Israel in Egypt, the people in Israel would have been just as happy to stay there in Egypt, set up an altar to God, right up next to all the other altars of all these false gods, and just stay right there and worship God. What does God do? God separates them from Egypt into a separate place because he wants a people who are separated to himself. He needs a separate people and a separate place where to be separate from error. We remember the story. We've often looked at the story of um, Ahab and Jehoshaphat and the prophet Micaiah, right? Ahab wants to go to war. He solicits his buddy Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat says... Okay, I'll go to war with you. But why don't we ask a word of the Lord first? Is there a prophet around we can ask? Forget Balaam. He wants to get Micaiah. So Micaiah comes in, prophesies, don't do it. So what does Ahab do? He rejects the word of God and he does it. But what does Jehoshaphat, otherwise a godly man, what does Jehoshaphat do? He goes along with him. This is 2 Chronicles 18, 19 in your Bibles. You can look at this story. We don't have time to turn there this morning. Jehoshaphat goes along with him. And it's like, Wow. What should Jehoshaphat should have done? He heard the word of Micaiah and he should have gotten out of there. I'm not going into battle with that guy. So now there's a consequence. And if you go, keep going, chapter 19, chapter 20, chapter 21 in 2 Chronicles, Jehoshaphat pays a price for that. Um, real quickly, like fast. I just can't resist. 2 Chronicles, hurry. <laughs> 2 Chronicles. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. I'm just going to go ahead and start reading. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem. Jehu, the son of Hanani, this is after the battle. Ahab is killed. Here's Jehoshaphat. Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? That's what he was doing. Ahab, you didn't hear Ahab say, I hate the Lord. He hated Micaiah. To hate the prophets of the Lord is to hate the Lord. But Ahab hated the Lord, hated the Lord by his actions. We have people who've gone out of here who hate the Lord by their actions. We're to separate from them because they are enemies of the cross. They are enemies of God. They hate God by the way that they do things, by the way that they live their lives, by the way that they attack a biblical church. They're God haters. Are we to love them? Are we to spend time with them? Nope. 
Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore, he says to Jehoshaphat, otherwise a godly man here, he says, therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you. So the wrath of God was over Jehoshaphat because of this decision not to separate from Ahab. Did Jehoshaphat learn his lesson in this? No, he did not. Look at chapter 21. Let's see here. Am I in the right place? 20. This is where he uh, attaches himself to Ahaziah. Look at verse 35, chapter 20, verse 35. Thank you, brother. After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, allied himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who acted very wickedly. And he allied himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. He didn't learn his lesson. He continued to ally himself with the wicked. We're to separate ourselves. We're to separate ourselves. We have many examples of this, many examples of this in the New Testament. Through unrepentant sin, in Matthew 18, church discipline, we're to separate ourselves from those who are unrepentant sinners who we're to treat as tax collectors and heathens. We're simply to detach ourselves from them. Romans chapter 16, verse 17, the Bible says, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoid them. It's interesting there, it's kind of, it doesn't restrict the doctrine. It's the doctrine which you've learned and it's any doctrine that would cause divisions and offenses. If a person with their doctrine is causing divisions and offenses, something is wrong. Withdraw yourself from them. Uh, we're not to keep company with it. We're not to, okay, well, it's this doctrine, not this doctrine. Okay, so let them go in the church because it's not that doctrine. No, it's whatever d doctrine that you are using to cause division, disruption, offenses in the church, stop that. And if that person won't stop, then avoid them. It says that, 2 John, verses nine through 11, 2 Corinthians chapter six, come out from among them and be separate. C.H. Spurgeon, during the downgrade controversy, said this. He said, at any rate, cost what it may, to separate ourselves from those who separate themselves from the truth of God is not alone our liberty, but our duty. Sometimes that duty is very difficult, uh, very hard, very challenging to obey. We must do that. The Lord has given us that instruction. It's in for, our, for our good. There are many, many, many voices that clamor to reject this biblical teaching because God is love. God is love, and so it leads us to ecumenicalism, ecumenism. Uh, everybody just goes along to get along. We sacrifice truth for the sake of a false sham peace. We're not to do that. We're not to tolerate error. We're not to tolerate bad company. It will have its effect. Robert Leitner said this, the longer error is condoned, the easier it becomes to compromise the truth. Somehow a conditioning process goes on. An unhealthy toleration of false doctrine usually leads to accommodation to it to one degree or another. When that which is false is left unchecked, unexposed, or unopposed, it gradually appears to be less and less objectionable to more and more people. It loses its true character and looks more and more like merely a weak and watered down form of the truth a less desirable option than the truth to be sure, but not the falsehood that it really is and, when, and was once thought to be. That's what happens in our flesh. We have to base all of this on the word of God to avoid that from happening. You know, the Christian life, let me leave you with this. The Christian life, the, the teaching of this, 1 Timothy chapter 6, this passage, really reminds me a lot of, just by application, of Nehemiah at the wall, building the wall. Nehemiah, building this wall, had to build a wall. You have the wall of your Christian life you're building, right? The house that is set upon a rock. You're building this house over the course of your Christian life. And you want to build it on the rock because when the storm comes, you want your house to stand. You know, Nehemiah is at the wall and he's got God's people there, his co-laborers there at the wall, building the wall. It's not enough for them to stand at the wall with a trowel in their hand, right? Putting on mortar and shoring up the wall. What else do they need in their hand? A sword. They've got a trowel in one hand, Nehemiah, and a sword in the other. For the Christian life, you need a trowel in one hand building your wall, building your house, erecting it on the bedrock of God's word such that it does not fall. Your trust, faith in Christ, your faith in God, such that your house in that day will stand. But in order to do that effectively, you need a sword in the other because there are enemies that will come along and seek to destroy the work that you're doing. <laughs> They will seek to undermine you in the work. They will seek to distract you from the work. Listen, come out here and plant these daisies. Don't worry about that house. <laughs> you need a trowel in one hand and you need a sword in the other. 
And that's the teaching of Scripture. While you are hard at work building the wall, you need to be hard at work fighting off the enemies of your wall. While you're at work growing in the Lord, you need to be hard at work battling against sin, battling against error, battling against worldly influence, battling against the enemy. It takes both a trial and a sword. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this teaching, God. Thank you for this uh, the reminder that is so powerful, so profound. And God, help us. Uh, we have the sword of the Spirit in our hands. Praise be to God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And as we seek to live the Christian life, build our Christian life, Lord, we, we want to stand before you one day, Lord, having our lives represented by precious stones, not by wood, hay, and stubble. And so as we live this Christian life, God, help us to wield the sword of the Spirit, to defend ourselves against the wiles of the wicked one. And Lord, strengthen us by your Spirit to live the Christian life and to fend off the enemies of our soul. And I pr pray, God, that you protect my brothers and sisters here. Protect them from that onslaught of the enemy. Preserve them. God, hold them. Keep them in Christ. Guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And strengthen us for the battle. And Lord, we want to persevere to the end and be saved for your glory, God, for your worship. And for the good of our own eternal soul. Thank you, Lord, for this teaching. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit which strengthens us. And thank you for Christ. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.